and welcome to NextGen Finance, an SCB podcast about sustainable finance. My name is Lina Apsheva. I am a sustainable finance analyst here at SCB, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Gregor Vulturius, an advisor in sustainable finance. Welcome, Gregor. Or you are actually our first return guest on the podcast, so I should say welcome back. Oh, thank you so much. Great. Do we get a little prize or something? Oh, it's great to be back. We're really looking forward to this conversation. So, Gregor, as I'm sure you know, uh, in the past few years, the sustainable finance market has been focusing, or at least the, a lot of the conversations have been focusing quite a lot on topics that are a little bit different from carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. So we're looking quite a lot at things like healthcare, diversity, biodiversity, and even on our podcast, we've covered some of these topics. But nevertheless, carbon and greenhouse gas emissions are still a really big part of the sustainable finance market and the way that issuers measure them, the way they, they report on them, plays a huge part in this market. So the idea is that we will finally cover this very important topic, which is in a way a pillar uh, of the market, and maybe even do a series on, on this topic. So it's really great that you agreed to join the first episode and talk a little bit about what is carbon, what are carbon emissions, how are companies measuring and reporting on them, and also what does it mean for sustainable finance? So how about we jump right in? Yeah, what are carbon emissions? When it, it comes to corporates and how they report on carbon, they generally are asked to report on three different types of emissions. So we've got scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. So let's imagine you own a factory. So um, whatever you are burning at your facility, be it oil, um, or be it gas, that is generally considered your scope one emissions. So the emissions that you are producing directly by combusting fossil fuels. The scope two emissions then are emissions that are generated uh, by the purchase of electricity or heat or cooling. So the emissions themselves that might have been generated by someone else, but they are being generated because you are actually using the energy in your own production process or, you know, if you have a big office building, then your scope two emissions would be the electricity that you're using. So scope one and two emissions, those are pretty easily understood emissions. They're usually measured. It's very highly standardized. So um, that isn't the real issue. The big challenge right now is scope three emissions. So scope three emissions are emissions that happen as a result of a company's activities. Um, but they are not directly measured by the company. So, as an example, uh, you are a car manufacturer. Um, your scope one and two emissions relate to the emissions that happen in your factory uh, by your use of electricity, for example, or gas, or whatever other fossil fuels that you might have. But then when you deliver the car, then the car gets used by your customer. And the emissions that, have, that you know occur by driving around the car, if it's a fossil fuel car, if it's an internal combustion car. So that those are called downstream activities, downstream emissions, and they are part of the scope three emissions. So that's downstream. And what's also hard to measure is the upstream emissions. So if you're a car manufacturer, again, using an example, you are sourcing steel or aluminum from someone to build your cars, that should also factor in into scope three emissions. So scope one and two and three emissions, that is what uh, our companies generally have to report on when it comes to, to carbon emissions. Gregor, you are a scientist in background, right? Before you joined us. Used to be me. anyway. So if we maybe take a step back and look at a little bit more base level, what is even carbon? And why is it that when a car manufacturer manufactures a car, they put this thing called carbon in the atmosphere. And also we say oftentimes carbon emissions, oftentimes we say greenhouse gas emissions. So what is the difference between these two? So uh, carbon emissions, it's just CO2. So you combust, you oxidize a, a carbon atom. And that is what's happening when you, you know, light a match at home or if you, uh, you know, press the button on a, on a gas turbine. So those are carbon emissions. And as you rightly uh, point out, there are many more greenhouse gas emissions. So greenhouse gas emissions are generally defined as those emissions that have an effect on how much heat we're trapping within the Earth's atmosphere. 
actually one of the most common, probably the most common greenhouse gas, which we don't talk much, is water vapor. It's a highly effective, um, a highly powerful greenhouse gas. The difference is that we as humans don't add more water vapor to the atmosphere. So that's why we cannot explain the type of in temperature increase that we've seen in the last 150 years by an additional water vapor, because there isn't more water vapor in the atmosphere. What there is more is CO2 and methane. These are the, the most two most common human-induced carbon emissions, or sorry, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, CO2 emissions caused by humans it's around 78% of all the anthropogenic human-induced greenhouse emissions are coming from carbon dioxide. And then you have methane emissions. And methane emissions have become more and more discussed. And that's because methane has a much shorter lifespan. It's only in the atmosphere for around 12 years, but it's 28 times more powerful than CO2 emissions. And that is why there's a lot of attention being paid to reduce methane emissions. Methane emissions occur mostly in the oil and gas business. And agriculture, isn't it? Agriculture, um, the burping cows are a, a well-known example, um, but what's less known is rice paddies. So oh, wow. Rice is a big source of, of methane emission. So another buzzword in, in the market is decarbonization. And I was wondering if I could ask you, what is decarbonization? And, you know, I guess uh, when you look at decarbonization from... Um, corporate perspective when did it even become this type of a buzzword well first of all let's let's define decarbonization let's start there so decarbonization generally includes three sets of activities so we start with a mitigation of um, carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions so the reduction of emissions that's pretty well known so instead of using a coal power plant you're using solar cells uh, instead of using uh, internal combustion cars, you're having uh, better electric cars, preferably, you know, uh, powered by, by green or clean electricity. Um, so uh, that's also called abatement. So you're abating, reducing, mitigating emissions. That's one pillar. And it's actually, if we are thinking of as in a hierarchy, that is the most important one. So corporate should think, the first thing that corporate should think of when they hear the word decarbonization is reducing your scope one, and two, and eventually scope three emissions. That should be, be the, the main focus of all the work. The second activity is compensation. There's a lot of companies out there that want to have so-called carbon neutral products. And what that implies is that you are compensating for the emissions that your products are causing, either by their use or even their production. And the third part is what's called neutralization. Because there will be some sectors and some industries and some regions where we will not be able to mitigate, neutralize all the emissions by just replacing fossil fuels with clean fuels. There will be some sectors where that's just not possible. Cement industry is one, agriculture is one. And for these unavoidable emissions, you might need to neutralize. And you can neutralize by something called the carbon removal, where you are somewhat catch carbon from the atmosphere and then store it permanently. So the decarbonization consists of reducing your emissions, maybe compensating for those emissions that you have not yet reduced, and eventually neutralize unavoidable emissions using removals. Very interesting. And I'm very curious about the different ways to compensate for emissions or maybe reduce emissions, um, take emissions out of the atmosphere. But... I think we're going to save that for another episode because this is a really big topic and it's we'll probably need a bit more time to discuss that separately. But if we go back to the question of when did this become a trend? I think there's always been companies that have been at the forefront of this long before it became fashionable. I think we saw the, the first start of companies setting credible science-based targets, I would say three to four years ago. And it started with something that's called uh, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which is a, it's a group of NGOs and research institutes led by the World Resources Institute that are basically helping corporates to set emission reduction milestones and emission targets that are in line with the Paris Agreement and the latest science. 
And I believe that they started around 2016, 2017, um, you know, adjacent to the Paris Agreement. And if we're looking at how uh, science-based targets have proliferated, I mean, now we cover around around 80 to 90 percent of global emissions are under some type of net zero target. Uh, that includes over a thousand companies that have said we want to remove some emissions in line with science uh, and to fulfill our obligations under the Paris Agreement. And how would you say the sustainable finance market played into this development? Because, I mean, we've seen the first green bond back in 2008. Mm -hmm. And since then, green bonds usually traditionally focus quite a lot on reducing emissions, isn't it? And I, I can only imagine that that did still play a role in how companies started thinking a little bit. And not only companies, but other types of issuers. Um, because now that these sustainable finance products exist, companies can not only set targets and reduce their emissions, but also receive financing based on how well they're doing or receive financing in order to do that. Right. Um, and I think... Um if it comes to the target setting, I think the sustainable link products that are out in the market, be it bonds or loans, that's a really a marriage made in heaven because ideally you can set an incentive for a company that has said that they want to achieve net zero or they want to, to achieve certain emission reduction milestones that are in line with science um, and you tie a, a finance product to it. So you're, you're, you're giving them basically a carrot or a stick depending on how or what they're doing and on, on their or what they're performing on their targets. I think that's that's very helpful. Um, so we have conversations with the, the Science Based Targets Initiative, SBTI, uh, in making them understand that what they are giving us as a as a bank or as a you know financial institution is a way of benchmarking um, our clients and, and our loan products and then to find a, a comparable ground to assess companies' performance. And that's very helpful for us. On the proceed side, what we see is that um, it's a bit of a check, chicken and egg issue there. So you know, the green bond, as you mentioned, the first green bond came out quite a long time ago, um, much before it became fashionable to set these emission reduction targets. Um, so you could say that maybe the green bond, the popularity of them has shown com companies, OK, great, there's a product out there where we can link our targets to, you know, where we can meet our CapEx needs to meet these targets with green bonds. And we see that more and more in green bonds frameworks, the companies are saying, look, we are using this money to meet our targets. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great synergy between targets in sustainable finance. And you mentioned, I think, very briefly, but I was wondering... What is the difference or is there a difference between different industries and regions when it comes to measuring and reporting and just working around these topics? And it's not just a difference in reporting, but it's also actually the difference in what types of targets they have. So to give you an example, if you were to follow the, the Science-Based Targets Initiative's own guidance, if we just follow the, the general trajectory which have, have to get us to net zero by you know mid-century that means that translate roughly to a four to five percent annual reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that covers everyone but certain sectors can move much faster I mean utility sector can move much faster because for them the technology solutions out there it's renewables right so that's that's on the target side. Then on the reporting side, yes, there's this big differences, and we are actually right now at a really a paradigm shift there. So let's say everything that happened before 2022 or maybe 2021, the field was dominated. The reporting of greenhouse emissions was dominated by voluntary initiatives. The the primary candidate here was the uh, the greenhouse protocol, again led by the World Resources Institute, and that has actually existed in. In over 20 years now and that gives companies a very clear guidelines and methodology how to emit, to report in their scope one two and three emissions and that's very helpful alongside that you had something called cdp that's formerly known as the carbon disclosure project which is an open access database where they are actually asking companies please report in your emissions to us based maybe on the on the greenhouse protocol and then more well, lately, you had something called the uh, Task Force for Climate-Related Disclosures, which 
asks companies not just to report on their emissions, but also on their strategies and their governance structures, how they want to reduce emissions and, and take climate action. So Greenness Protocol, CDP, and the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, these have been volunteer initiatives, and they have been so successful. So right now, regu regulators are taking action because the, the shortcomings of these volunteer initiatives is that they are within inconsistent. They use different methodologies. They are voluntary, meaning that they are not you know, applying to every single co corporate. They might, you, know, you might have some corporates that are doing really well in reporting. Some others have just not done it. So that's an issue for investors to understand, to compare. And you have particularly inconsistency also in, in scope three emission measurements, and that's that's an issue. So to counter all these shortcomings, regulators are taking action. Last year, the G20, so at a pretty high level, they agreed on a sustainable finance uh, roadmap where they said, okay, we want to make sure that we have consistent reporting on emissions by corporates within the G20, which of all intents and purposes, is all corporates in the world, right? That's a, the global economy, essentially. Um, so that's the, on the G20. And of course, the G20 is not doesn't have legislative powers. It doesn't, in and of itself, draft guidelines and standards. But it's it's setting a signal for for corporations and established standard setters to, to take action. So on that front, we have the newly found International Sustainability Standards Standards Board, the ISSB, that was just founded last year at COP26. And the ISSB is basically a merger of various voluntary carbon standard and sustainability standard boards. But it's under the IFRS, which is the International Foundation of, 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 of Financial Standards. So it has a much stronger weight to it because it's basically an established institution saying this is how you should report to uh, or this is how you should report emissions so that's great and then this year we've seen which something that i personally didn't expect which is that the sec the um, securities and exchange commission in the united states coming up with a proposal and saying okay we also want our u.s companies to report on scope one and two and three emissions and we want them to tell their investors and their shareholders how they are planning to address climate change. So that's that's quite a lot of, of action happening. And then within the EU, we have, I mean, an avalanche of actions. The, the one directive, I guess, that's most important for corporates is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which will enter force in 2025 and will apply then to the, to the financial year of 2024. And that directive is asking companies to report on emissions, on their business plans, on how they're dealing with, um, you know, capex plans, how their how the governance is situated to address climate change. So it's a really comprehensive new regulative package, and it actually applies to quite a lot more companies than what we've generally seen with these volunteer initiatives. Volunteer initiatives have been looking at, you know, the really big companies, but the uh, the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, that requires companies with more than 250 employees with, uh, you know, a, a turnover of 40 million euros or above. So we catch not just the big corporates, not just the S&P 500 companies, but we're looking at even at the, the privately owned companies, and we're looking at the smaller companies. So that's a quite a quite a change, I think. And it will be quite a challenge, I guess, for many corporates that haven't really reported or not reported consistently to do so. And they have now roughly two years' time uh, to do so and prepare themselves. Yeah. And when you look at the different industries, of course, there are also indus the industry-specific regulations. Right. And for us as a bank, we might not produce emissions directly by, you know, just sitting in the office and working on different transactions. However, our bulk of emissions is in the companies that we invest in and help finance, isn't it? So... Uh, I know that there are ways in which we are working with assessing and classifying how this, um, how many emissions are produced. So I was wondering if you know anything about that and could share about how 
a bank such as SCB can work with this topic as well. So yes, um, we at SCB, as you point out, Lena, we also have um, emissions. We have our own scope, uh, well, scope two emissions mostly because we don't do any burning of fossil fuels in our offices. Not that I know of anyway. Um, but uh, we, of course, we, we source electricity and heat and cooling and, and um, I believe we have done great great efforts in reducing as much as possible. But yeah, the majority of our emissions are scope three emissions. So scope three emissions for any financial institutions is the emissions that we are financing through, you know, to our own debt financing, um, and on the asset manager side on on the stuff that we are buying. Um, so that that's a considerable chunk. So and how do we then at SCB tackle this? So we've developed our own customer sustainability classification model, which is a model to help us understand where are our clients in their transition to net zero and, and towards the Paris Agreement. So it's called a model, but it's not a predictive model in a sense that it will tell us, okay, we're using these and these variables, and then we know where the company will be in 10 years. That's not exactly what we're doing here, but it's more of a descriptive model to look at, okay, so given what we know about the company, so we know it's maybe we know it's greenhouse gas emissions because we're asking them to report them to us. We know, of course, some of the business plans going forward, and then we map them um, against uh, various environmental objectives and climate, of course, being the, 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 the biggest one, maybe not necessarily the imp most important one. That's not really what the model does, but there's so much more data information on climate out there that the, it was it was quite obvious that we we're going for climate first so we are using the data that gets reported to us from our from our clients and and, and, and customers and then we group them into five different categories so we have what we consider sustainable companies and these are companies that have very very low emissions that are basically already where we would like the entire economy and world to be in 2050. So that could be companies that are, you know, producing renewable energy, for example. The next category is what we call Paris aligned uh, companies. So these are companies that have set targets and are performing according to a, a trajectory, a mission trajectory that will keep us under 1.5 degree of global warming. The next company uh, category that we have is transition. So these are, again, companies that are doing really well in reducing emissions, but they might not meet 1.5 degrees, that they only meet, let's say, two degrees targets. Um, and then we have two categories of, of companies where we see quite a lot more room for improvement. So we have companies that we call you know, the gradual change category, so they are in the transition, but what they're doing isn't not is just not enough to to live up to the the Paris Agreement. And then we have uh, what we call status quo companies or clients that uh, are not really yet uh, on the transition or have only very taken very very cautious steps. And um, we will use this model for different purposes. I mean, right now it helps us a lot in engaging with our clients. We know a lot more about them. We know the challenges, we know the performance, and then we can talk to them and ask, okay, what can we do as a bank for you to, you know, move up a notch and maybe go from a underperformer to, you know, a real leader on, on climate change. And then, of course, there are other ways. I mean, and, you know, we, we at SCB, we have our own, KPIs and sustainability targets. Now it's about you know increasing our green financing. It's reducing our ground exposure to fossil fuels. So there, of course, the the classification model also comes in for us to make a decision how we evaluate a relation to a client, for example. And I think the real beauty of this model is the visuals that it provides, where you can see the trajectory of moving towards net zero. So I could strongly recommend to to our listeners to um, look up our annual report for example where there are a couple of pages describing the model and also the accelerating change presentation um, where the CEO of SCB Yuan Torgibi has talked about this model uh, and that presentation can be found on SCB group.
But Gregor, I um, am wondering, listening to you, what are your expectations and what are your thoughts when it comes to what the future of this market and what the future of the way we look at greenhouse gas emissions as a society can hold? I think we are now, unfortunately, in a phase of accelerating climate change. Um, with the summer, this European summer behind us, probably being the hottest ever recorded. And, you know, every year we have, you know, the hottest summer. So, um, and we have to understand that with so much emissions already in the atmosphere, we, it's not going to get cooler. And I think that's the, that's the, that's the hard truth that we have to accept. Action we're taking now will eventually reduce temperatures, but that will take a long time. What that means is that there will be more and more pressure on corporates and on financial institutions like us to do utmost to you know live up to the Paris Agreement of limiting you know global warming to 1.5 degrees, and that that pressure will only grow. Um, and yes, right now there is quite a lot of concern on when it comes to energy supply to Europe, and there's different interpretations of this current situation. My personal interpretation is that it has shown us that you know we've been in Europe exposed to fossil fuels. Doesn't know where it's it doesn't matter where it's coming from really, but we've been, you know, our hands have been tied around the back. And we're now understanding the costs of of that of that um, entanglement with fossil fuels and how expensive it is to find alternatives. Um there was another report recently that, you know, it showed that we've been actually been saved over twenty billion euros in costs by solar power in Europe this summer. Nobody's talking about this, right? I mean so clean electricity and clean energy is already doing a, sh a share to reduce our costs. What I mean by this is we will see probably in the short term an increase in emissions. That's just a result of fuel switching from gas to coal, unfortunately. But hopefully we will then after that see an accelerated decarbonization. Because more and more of our clients understand that if we want not to relive this year, then we need to make sure that the energy we are using is, you know, coming from sources that we can rely on and it's clean. Um, so I think that's that's something that is now more and more understood. And we actually see already indications that investments, particularly in solar, are going up and they're now the highest they have ever been this year. So we see some positive signs. So a little bit of a hard truth, but also a little bit of positive news. So... Really appreciate your opinion on that. And before I let you go and get back to business, is there any piece of advice that you'd like to give to someone listening who maybe works in finance, but not directly in sustainability or even works in another area um, of business, but wants to think a little bit more about sustainability and incorporating it into their work? I think um, you should definitely check out the website of the Science Based Tires Initiative. Because it, I think there's a, there's great tutorials and explainers what science-based targets are. There's sector-based guidance. So you know if you're working in telecommunication or you're working in food and agriculture or you're working in automotives, you can just go on there and there's a guidance document for you to really understand. Okay, this is the challenge that we have ahead, and this is what expected us from science and civil society to do in terms of emission reductions. So that's great. Um, if you're more working, you know, in compliance and reporting, I mean, the ISSB, the this new standard board for sustainability reporting, um, I think the website is online now, and I should definitely recommend you to go there and check it out. I mean, this is going to be, aside from, you know, the regulation and the legislative bodies in your constituencies, the ISSB is going to be the primary source for you to understand what you need to report on going forward. That's great and very practical advice. So thank you so much, Gregor. Pleasure to listen to you as always. And Likewise. thank you to our listeners. As always, please feel free to like or subscribe to the podcast. Give us a review if you like the podcast and give us feedback at nextgenfin at sb.se. Like I mentioned earlier, this is going to be a bit of a series on carbon. So please stay tuned for next episodes where we continue talking on this very interesting and very important topic. But for now, bye. Bye.